Good evening. I'm James M. Jim Holland, Chairman of the Chesterfield County Board of Supervisors, and I proudly represent the Dale District, where we're located right now in our public meeting room. Thank you for joining us for this virtual community meeting to discuss our county's proposed fiscal year 2022 budget. It's ironic that today, one year ago, we went into a major shutdown because of this pandemic. Can you believe it? But one thing we've learned, I've learned over this last year is that leadership matters, integrity and competence matter. And so we are here today to kick off. This is the first session of our, or series of our budget hearings for, for the five magisterial districts of Chesterfield County. And of course, what's critically important in this process is you. We value your participation and your input in the budget as we have for the vast many of years we've done this. So your input is valued and appreciated. And you may email us tonight or through the course of this month. And I want to also let you know that if you are in any other district, you may attend the Dale District or any other district meeting during this month over the next couple of weeks. And you will see that posted on the screen, the times of those meetings, so that you can participate uh, in one or two or all, if you like, your pleasure. Uh, and I can assure you that all of the Board of Supervisors will review your comments as we consider the budget and make uh, recommendations on our public hearing, uh, which is scheduled for Wednesday, March 24th at 6 p.m. And we plan to adopt the budget on April the 7th, uh, given all the input that you're providing with us tonight. So again, I just want to thank you for tuning in tonight for being a part of this process. The good news about this is that we can reach so many more citizens, and that's why this virtual community meeting is so valued and appreciated. Joining me tonight is Mr. Matt Harris and Mr. Jared Durkin. I'm so pleased they're here because they're going to dive deep into the numbers, and I will be here to answer any questions that, uh, that may come up, and I will return toward the end of the presentation. But for right now, it's Mr. Harris and his proposed 2022 budget. Mr. Harris. Mike, first off. I appreciate that, Mr. Holland. We, tonight, at, uh, as you mentioned, this is really an opportunity to, uh, to turn this process to the citizens and, and begin to have that, uh, that community dialogue. So just a little bit of housekeeping before we get into this. We're going to go through a 20, 30 minute presentation at most. Um, we are scheduled to go no longer than 8 o'clock. We will stay till uh, the questions sort of dry up at the end. So if, if that's a few minutes before 8, so be it. If it goes all the way 8, that, that's fine as well. But uh, we're going to try to leave the bulk of the time. Tonight is all the Facebook sessions uh, for questions, for interactions that, uh, that you can submit uh, through the Facebook app. So. That's, that's sort of where we're at. Tonight is an abridged version of the presentation that was given in this room yesterday evening. Uh, so that's about 100 slides, 100 PowerPoint slides. We're going to do about uh, you know, 15 or 20 of those and really hit the high points. So we're not going to do everything that's in that presentation so that we can leave plenty of time for, for questions and comments, uh, at, again, at the end of the presentation. But all of those materials are posted now on the county's blueprint Chesterfield site, the actual video uh, of all of the presentations from the department, all the interaction, uh, which was a, a very good afternoon yesterday, about a four hour work session, uh, will be up on the website uh, very soon if it's not already there. And then if you want even more detail, the full budget document is also available now uh, on the county's website. So you can go and drill into uh, any specific area that you might have interest in. So there are any number of ways to, uh, to get the information. Again, tonight is sort of hitting the highlights, uh, summary pieces, but uh, we also want to direct you to that full slate of resources. Um, jumping into the presentation, uh, you'll see on the screen now, and again, this is just hitting the highlights again of, of what we talked about yesterday in this room, but we want to give you a little flavor of all the pieces and parts of the presentation. We always start every budget presentation off with sort of that economic backdrop, and I think no year is that more important than the one we're in right now. As Mr. Holland mentioned, um, you know, really a year ago, 
things tra changed dramatically. We were talking earlier that actually the first one of these budget meetings we did for fiscal 21 budget I was at the Clover Hill Library, and that was an in-person session. It was a packed room, and uh, the next day, you know, we that was the last really in-person meeting uh, that we did. So it, it all changed very, very quickly. We pivoted to uh, these, these Facebook Live events, and I think we'll keep them, quite honestly, uh, moving forward because it does give us a, a much wider audience, and, and you know, we're able to record the content and just reach a lot more folks. Uh, that being said, in the course of you know, presenting the original budget a year ago to the, what the board ultimately adopted, the economy did uh, change a lot. And you see that shown in this chart. You see that massive uptick in unemployment that occurred really over the course of, uh, of two months. I think the messages in this slide are the following. First and foremost, there was a shock to the system, but unlike the last recession you see on the, the left-hand part of this uh, chart, which was a gradual up, and a gradual down. Fortunately for, uh, for Chesterfield County, for the region, and really for the state, um, this has been an instant up and a very, very quick back down to, uh, to more normal levels. You see Chesterfield County unemployment rate currently sits at about 4.3%. Um, so it is, we did spike up to you know, over double digits, but that came down very quickly. And we've seen economic conditions in the county and in the region for the most part uh, to be very strong. Certainly there are still some pockets of folks that uh, you know, we are keeping an eye on and we'll touch on that as we get into the tax relief portion of this uh, presentation. But I think it is important to note that we feel like the economic conditions here to present this budget to you this year are, are in good shape. The fundamentals, the, the core fundamentals that underpin this plan are solid. And, uh, and we believe in uh, this plan very much based on what we're seeing from, uh, from those economic conditions. There's a lot more information, again, available in the full presentation, but I just want to give a little, uh, you know, flavor of that. You know, the weird thing about uh, this plan, you know, COVID aside, is the fact that we really, there's been about four, there's been four budgets in 12 months. And I think this chart is, you know, a lot of numbers, and not, it's not important to memorize them, but I do want to give a sense of the, the journey that we've been in on a very short period of time. A year ago, and that, again, that Clover Hill Library, the budget we stood up, and proposed, I uh, was at 773 million. It was a 5% increase from the prior year. You know, everything felt very normal. In the course of just a couple of weeks, uh, that budget was totally redone, cut over $50 million out of it. Uh, and that's the middle uh, figure in this chart at 721. And that's the, that's the figure by which this is measured against. And we bring it up for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, uh, for S fiscal year 22, which is what we're talking about here, so our fiscal year is uh, six months ahead of the calendar year, so we're talking our fiscal year as we touch on every year, for those of you who, uh, who may be new to the process, begins on July the 1st. So we're talking about fiscal 22, and we're talking about this July 1st to, uh, to next June 30. But if you just look at and you've read some of the articles um, that have been out there about the budget, it's a large increase. It's almost $85 million. But I think the core thing to remember because of the way that's unfolded over the last 12 months, this is really a two-year budget increase that's, uh, that's being reflected here. Uh, the fourth number over the 21 revised, that's back from December. We came before the board and said, based on that unemployment chart and a number of other companion uh, measures we looked at and said, things are actually doing a lot better than we had feared. We took a very conservative approach and we cut $50 million out of the budget. We came back in December and said, you know, we're in a much stronger place. The fundamentals really have uh, have survived this pretty well. So when you when you look at that figure, you saw some some pretty significant growth in this current fiscal year, which gave us a, you know a stronger base to build the 22 plan off at uh, at 806. So while it is a large number, 85 million dollars is not what you're going to see from us moving forward. You won't see that kind of number in the past. You have to kind of take it with a grain of salt because it is effectively a, a two-year increase reflecting that uh, much quicker rebound in economic conditions. Uh, wouldn't be a budget presentation without a little technical snafu. <laughs> Dave, you got to help me here. There you go. Perfect. So this is, uh, this is looking, at, looking at that $85 million you see down in the bottom corner there, 84.9. This is showing where did that growth occur. 
And uh, when you look at Chesterfield County, our big revenue sources are real estate taxes, which are primarily driven by home values, uh, local sales and use taxes, uh, and, and other personal property taxes. Primarily, your, uh, your vehicles is the easiest way to wrap your head around that. So the growth from a revenue perspective, that $84 million, comes first and foremost from real estate taxes. Chesterfield County's uh, real estate market is very healthy. We saw an average residential assessment increase of just over 4%. We'd like that to be somewhere between the 3 and 4% range. We believe that to be a sustainable, healthy level of growth. And uh, that's what we saw over the course of the last year. So that's the, that's the headlining figure. That, that's our main uh, revenue engine, and it performed very well. But again, in a sustainable range. It's not like it was 05, 06, 07. We don't see or sense any bubble forming there. The local sales and use tax number really is a, you know, sort of a COVID phenomenon. A lot of folks staying closer to home, spending their dollars at, uh, at Chesterfield Merchants, um, and we've, you know, went th through that uh, in great detail yesterday. But you see, uh, you know, grocery store sales, home improvement store sales. I mean, I think we can all probably relate to some home improvement project that we finally tackled over the last 12 months. And so you saw a real, uh, you know, sense of folks staying closer to home, not willing to, or, uh, you know, recognizing that they can get the things that they need much closer uh, to their residents here in Chesterfield County. So we saw a very, very strong increase uh, in sales tax and consumer spending over last year, almost 10%. So you see a $20 million number there and really reflective again of sort of that COVID phenomenon. But overall, that's where the uh, the major drivers of the $84 million, primarily from sales tax and property taxes. Uh, assessments did go up to 4%. The board has uh, chosen to leave the, the real estate rate at 95 cents. However, the uh, you know the average tax bill, when you multiply those two together, will go up on average around 4% uh, for this uh, tax year 2021. So this is a, you know, kind of staying on the revenue side, and I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I do think this is a story that, you know, we're going to be uh, louder and louder in telling moving forward. Our core revenues are, are what we just talked about on the prior slide, but a lot of pieces of our revenue portfolio are feeling pressure or just being taken away altogether. And the state has a big role there. You see here on this slide a number of areas, primarily on the revenue side, but there's definitely some expenditures as well, where the state has either not kept up with funding formulas, as, uh, as you see here with House Bill 599, which is police uh, state support for local police operations, the grantors tax, which has been uh, hopefully temporarily taken away, uh, from locals, ABC profits, oh, and, and these things happened over time. But I think what you're seeing is just a, as a as a footnote, as a disclaimer, as part of this budget. When you add all of those state actions up, as well as some of the mandates that have come down, uh, you know, from from Richmond, it adds up to a, a very conservative estimate of about 13.6 million dollars. Just looking at this select group of items, that's a four cent increase or impact on our bottom line when you look at what an average penny is. So that's $13 million that could go into other programs and services or $13.6 million that could go towards uh, overall tax relief by being able to bring that rate down. So I think it, nothing to do as part of this budget here, but I do think we want to make this part of our story moving forward. And you will hear again more and more uh, sessions and committee work around this topic as we you know, just want to make sure that the, the public understands that when, uh, when the state does things, it often has a, a financial impact here at the local level, and we want to be very, very transparent about that. You know, one example or sort of corollary of that is school funding. Uh, that's a companion, if you will, funding model between state and local, but the state has a model of uh, quality that they put out called the SOQ, or Standards of Quality, and it, it requires local investment up to a certain level. Um, that SOQ model, again, this is another one of these topics that I think we'll be partnering with our uh, school colleagues on to make sure that everyone understands. That SOQ level is not what the Chesterfield community, Chesterfield residents, folks that send their kids to school every day, that level of quality that's dictated in SOQ is not anything that uh, anyone would really accept at the end of the day. An example that we talked about yesterday in the work session was classroom size at fourth and fifth grade level of 35 to one. Uh, so the state is dictating a certain level of quality, but again, the local expectation is far beyond that. So 
Uh, over the last 10 years, the county has put $130 million a year on average on top of what that state required level of quality is. So the only thing to, to note there is that's, you know, that's a topic that we need to continue to, again, to be loud about with, uh, with our community and really you know, maybe take a look at those SOQ standards moving forward because when the state says that they are funding something for education, it's, we're responsible for not only what our contractual piece of that, but make sure that we are funding to those local standards. And that's a, that's a topic that, uh, that hits localities all across the state and something we need to tell more about. So again, nothing to do necessarily for this budget, but these are things that uh, do impact the bottom line, our ability to deliver programs and services when it does get to budget time. So let's look at major components of the budget because this is always, uh, I think this is a very, very helpful slide. So we're talking first and foremost, as we always do, the county, where we are in the process, the county administrator is making his proposal, the proposal you're seeing summarized here tonight to the board of supervisors. Those are the materials that are out there. And the main operating fund for uh, Chesterfield County is the general fund. So that's what houses all of your public safety, all your quality of life, uh, items such as parks and libraries and social services, uh, all of the administrative functions that, uh, that go along with local government are all encapsulated there, as is that local transfer to meet those SOQ standards plus that supplement of, of over $130 million. That's what lives in the general fund. So what you're looking at here in this chart is just looking at the budget in, in a few major pieces. So when you take the general fund, which is, again, proposed at the 806, and you pull out that school transfer, the, the amount of money that's being proposed to spend on core local government services, not including schools, is $461 million. The school's budget, when you add in all the sources, the state, the local transfer, some federal programs, food service grants, all the things that are associated with there, uh, proposed at $810 million. And then utilities, which is another part of what we do, and we'll touch on that at the tail end of the presentation just to, uh, to give a sense of that. It doesn't often get as much airplay when you get around to budget time, but you know, certainly uh, the high quality utility system is a backbone of, uh, of any good community, and we wanna make sure we're, we're paying attention to that. But just gives you some relative scale of the pieces and parts uh, of this budget, and you see how large the, the school component is compared to uh, the other pieces. So just talk real quickly in a couple of slides, you know, the drivers, the factors, the things that we look at when we're building a plan. And this is just a representation of things that have happened over the last 12 months, COVID being sort of the, the highlight there. But it's, the message here is very simply this. We have not just reacted to COVID. We're trying to learn from it and figure out what are those lessons that we can glean from the last 12 months that then should impact and weigh in on how we are recommending to allocate dollars uh, for the upcoming budget. We, we've learned about you know, uh, customer preferences, about resident preferences, what's really important to them, how can we do business differently. So it's, it, you go through something that COVID is tough as COVID, you know, it's really, really important imperative that we learn those lessons and try to you know, reposition our programs uh, so that we are taking all of that into account and providing an even more nimble you know, sort of a service model going forward. So you'll see some examples of where we've pivoted resources in the, in the back end of this plan to be responsive to all the things that we've learned uh, from COVID over the course of the last 12 months. Demographics, also always something we're gonna take a look at. Uh, you see here just a couple of things that we always keep our eye on. The top chart looking at single family housing growth. Um, certainly, we continue to see healthy levels of uh, residential investment, but certainly nothing unprecedented like we saw again back in that sort of 05, 06, 07, 08, sort of that bubble period where we're growing at a level that was not sustainable over the course of the last, you know, six to eight years, growth averaging right between, you know, one to 1.3 percent. That puts, on average, 1,300 to 1,400 new single-family units on the ground. Certainly, there's other components of housing and population growth, but we want to make sure that we are growing at a sustainable level so that when we get to budget time and you have to put those programs and services and facilities to match and service the growth, that you have some balance there, and we feel very good 
uh, about this level of growth. You want to have some growth. Having sustainable growth is, a, is an absolute necessity for a healthy community, and we feel like at 1.3%, we're hitting that mark. At the bottom chart, uh, something that we talk about from time to time, but this is looking at the percentage of single-family homes that have a student that's currently enrolled at C in CCPS at county schools. And you see over time a pretty clear trend that that has been uh, dwindling down, and that's not because student enrollment is not increasing, but it's really the uh, a reflection of our overall demographic shifts where we're seeing more and more folks uh, not only move into the county, because as you can see in the, in the top chart, you know, we're not really seeing a massive increase there, but what we are seeing is shifts of folks wanting to stay here, particularly that 65 uh, and older demographic, folks that are retiring, choosing to make Chesterfield a, a home for a lifetime and not necessarily you know, moving to uh, you know, another locality or another place you know, on the East Coast or wherever to retire. They're wanting to stay here. Uh, as Dr. Casey always says, they've put roots down, they've got grandkids here, they've got children here. So we're seeing those multi-generational families and that's putting uh, you know, pressure on this demographic chart. Again, student enrollment is, uh, is growing at a healthy clip, but what you see in the message here is we need to be cognizant of that fact and our service portfolio, service mix, has to reflect the diversity of the folks that we serve. So we need to make sure that we've got, you know, the senior services and that we're looking and being cognizant of the fact that 73% of households do not have a kid in, uh, in Chesterfield County Schools. That by no means suggests that we're put, pulling money back from the school division. You never, you're not going to see another budget at any point in Chesterfield's history making a larger investment in the school system. But again, we're trying to find that balance. And again, as uh, Mr. Durkin will uh, elaborate on further in just a few moments, we're trying to find that, uh, that right balance as uh, we get move through this plan. So where are the dollars being invested? You got $806 million as part of this general fund budget. Where are they going to go? How do we spend the dollars that are entrusted to us? Uh, this chart is something I think is a real simple, nice way to understand that. And what we have say consistently year after year and proud to do so is we spend 78 cents out of every dollar on really what the three, um, you know, key pieces, three components of local government, being education, public safety, and infrastructure, or as we show it here as capital. The good news is, and it, it, it represents quite the seismic shift, a year ago, this mark was at 76 cents out of every dollar. You may think, well, two cent movement is all, really not all that much, but when you consider the magnitude of dollars that are invested here, moving at two cents really is uh, a, a meaningful and measurable uh, achievement and continuing to push more and more of the resources that are entrusted to us to those three core areas. And we're able to do that, as we say, each and every year because we do things like the general government, the blue slice over on the right-hand side of the chart. We do everything else that we do, all of the support services, everything from IT to legal to finance to human resources to all the administrative functions. We do all of those things for only six cents on the dollar. So we have very, very low overhead uh, when it comes to building these financial plans, which allows us, again, to push more and more money, public safety, education, roads, parks, trails, libraries, all of the things that, uh, that folks you know, want to see in their communities. With that being said, I'm going to turn it over to our budget director, Mr. Durkin, who's going to walk you through uh, in more specificity what, uh, what's included in this plan. Thank you, and good evening, everybody. Um, I'm here to talk about, a bit more about the nuts and bolts of this budget. The fiscal year 22 budget was really built on the investment started by the board throughout fiscal year 2021, especially with our amendments made in December. We really took a long, hard look at our base budgets, as Mr. Harris alluded to, you know, COVID has really changed the dynamic of everything and how we provide our services. And we really built this budget line by line that I'm sure my team in the budget department can attest to. Um, you know, simply restoring those targeted reductions that we made in fiscal year 2021 wasn't enough. It's not what's expected of us and it's not what we did. One of the things that we really took a long, hard look at this year is, you know, we recognize the financial burdens on our residents and businesses, and we looked for efficiencies within our existing allocations. 
We've made a lot of investment into the data sphere in the last few years, and we've done some long-term analysis. And before coming to you asking for more resources, um, we really looked to see what departments had that could be re reallocated. And I'm pleased to say that through that effort, we identified efficiencies of just under $2 million. The chart before you identifies four that I think really tell that story. Um, between the four of these, um, the cost without any efficiencies was about $1.6 million. After we worked with the departments, the net cost really to fund these was just under um, $900,000. So for general services, they had a lot of custodial and painting services that were in contract. By giving them additional FTEs, we could release ourselves from those contracts and bring those services in-house. The real estate assessment office, again, another investment in technology with the computer-aided mass appraisal system. We were able to realize three FTE efficiencies, saving $192,000 from just under the half million dollar request. The fire department, and I have to really give some thanks to Chief Center and Chief Fitch, um, they have had to outsource a lot of their training and use a lot of sworn positions to provide training for firefighters. Working with them, we're able to add four um, civilian positions to that training cadre, freeing up those officers to go back onto the front lines for a net cost to the general fund and you, the taxpayer, of $44,000. And libraries, which I'll talk about a few slides in, have really started to pivot towards moving from part-time ratio to a full-time ratio and working with them, able to realize savings in part-time to fund an additional seven positions in this 2022 budget. So the themes of this budget really coalesce around six items, um, and I'll walk through these in a little bit more specificity in a minute. But recognizing the workforce, investing in our children's future, continuing our commitment to public safety, enhancing quality of life, diversifying and bolstering our economic base, and finally strengthening investment in infrastructure and technology. So one of the things that you know, Dr. Casey and the board have, have said multiple times is that you know, this budget really represents the year of the workforce. Um, from our employees pivoting to other areas where they no longer could provide services due to COVID, to our mental health professionals through telehealth and our frontline responders have really stepped up and shown everyone you know, the best and enduring qualities of the workforce. And this budget takes these steps to recognize that and to say thank you to all the employees in the county for everything that they've done over the last year. And so one of the big strides that we've made over the, um, the last 12 months and will continue to do over the next few years is our employee compensation. When we develop our budget every year, it's at the forefront of our mind. We realize that we can't do everything in, in one go. We've made um, strident attempts over the last few years and through merit raises and tuition reimbursement budgets. But this budget really takes it one step further. And so one of the things that the board really took initiative on last with our December amendments was fully funding our public safety pay plan across our three agencies. That costs 13.8 million in year one. It's fully funded in fiscal year 22. And that covers over 1,300 employees. Additionally, working with the school board, superintendent and staff, we were able to help um, enable the teacher pay study. It impacts over 4,700 teachers and other staff with raises for the most compressed teachers, as you can see on the slide rising between 8 and 11% and an average of 5.5%, totaling more than $23.2 million. So those two things taken together is a th over $37 million investment in our workforce. And we've essentially removed com compression from our vocabulary. But the other thing I'd like to point out with this is that, you know, we've done this using local dollars. We've not done it using a lot of one-time monies. Um, and that's something that, you know, we've built a sustainable plan. One of the things we brought before the board in December for the public safety pay plan was a policy to reserve money in years going forward that if we ever were to experience another economic crunch, we had the resources in place to make sure that, you know, compression didn't creep back in to our vocabulary. And some of the other items that we've done is for our general government employees, there's a mid-year 2% merit the restoration of all career development and training programs. And one of the things that came before the board last night was authorizing a final study for that final leg of the employees. You know, we, we couldn't do everything in one year, but we wanted to put a down payment to show, 
you know, we have a commitment to you as much as you've committed to us over the last 12 months. And so the actions with the board last night really start that train in motion. And one of the other things that we've really pivoted to with COVID is telework, again, relates to the investment in our um, infrastructure. To give some context, um, in December, we used the Microsoft Teams platform and we went from about 200 active users to over 2,000. And we were able to continue to provide a lot of those services that were done in person before. And it's really thanks to the, the workforce that we were able to achieve that. Second theme is, you know, invest in our children's future. You know, our educators had to pivot just like we did and that their dedication to our children, you know, remains. And one of the things that we've done over the last year is uh, this budget increases our local transfer by $18 million. It's the largest increase in history. Again, it bears worth repeating, we were able to help implement that first stage of the teacher pay plan. But one of the things we were also able to do was help enable a $4 million investment for differentiated financial support and differentiated staffing support, recognizing that you know, no two schools and no two students are the same. And through this budget, we're able to help the school board achieve their top two priorities for fiscal year 22. And finally, one of the th uh, another initiative is that continued major maintenance investment, just under a million dollars. And that comes on, as it says there, the heels of $58 million investment that we made in fiscal year 21. One of the um, advantages that we have as a county with a triple triple A rating is we're able to take advantage of the market conditions and really push that investment towards some backlog and school maintenance. So as I said before, with the public safety pay plan, we're really taking the compression out of the equation, but you know, we are continuing our commitment to public safety. We can pivot even more resources to their operation and operations, and this budget does that. Um, in the fire department, we are proposing to add 20 positions to fully staff the middle of the fire station, to add a ladder truck and medic to the system. Our capital program funds the replacement of Mentorica Fire Station, I believe the oldest in the county is 69 years old. It implements a new police deployment plan, an initiative of Chief Katz, it's for an extra nine positions at $1.8 million. And it expands the police service aid program that we launched in fiscal year 2020, which serves as a really good pipeline for future police officers. But additionally, one of the things that the police department were able to achieve last year was the funding for 15 positions through a grant. This fiscal 22 budget continues our local match for that program. And in our bond referendum, which we'll touch on a little bit later, this identifies four police stations, three replacements, one new, and then two fire station replacements and two fire station renovations. And for our sheriff's office, it adds four positions for staff and flexibility and facility maximization, as well as some courthouse security enhancements and admin positions, especially with everything related to COVID. Next theme, and I think this is one of the big things that's happened over the last 12 months, is you know enhancing the quality of life. Traditionally, we've seen the pillars of the budget as public safety, education, and transportation. I really think that this has become like a fourth pillar. You know, some of the events that we've all taken for granted over the last 12 months, we've either had to really curtail back or still can't do. But our libraries and park system in particular have really helped and pivoted their services to help maintain the quality of life for all our residents here in the county. Our libraries, you know, they've, they've now acted as learning pods, an area for vaccine registration, warming centres with the recent ice storms. They've really redefined the role in our community and this budget recognises that. Fiscal year 21 amendments, we authorised um, conversion of 10 positions into full-time positions for the libraries and this budget builds upon that by adding another seven. And by the end of the five-year plan, their staffing for full-time will have risen from about 80 positions to 124, which is a 55% increase, which will eventually enable the addition of Sunday hours and longer opening hours to serve residents longer. On the capital side, we're proposing a $52 million investment to replace two libraries and to renovate an additional two. And parks has been one of those, you know, people may not have a lot of space to go out and take their mask off and walk and, you know, spatially distance from people but still maintain those relationships. But so in this budget, we're proposing a hefty investment in our park system, both in the operating and capital sides. 
Parks has taken on an additional 19 sites over the last 10 years with no corresponding increase in those staffing. This budget includes an additional $1.1 million and over a two year horizon it adds an additional 14 positions for an athletic field crew and principal maintenance workers, which is the largest investment in their staffing, as I say, in over a decade. On the capital side, we're proposing an additional $5.2 million in River City Sports Plex. That's on top of the $3 million that the board had authorised with their fiscal year 21 amendments. So in the space of just three fiscal years, we'll have invested over $8 million in that complex. You know, not pivoting that um, site is not just a regional leader in sports tourism, but really up and down the eastern seaboard of the US. And finally, you know, another investment we've made is four and a half million dollars to renovate the old Beulah Elementary School. And there's some other investments in there that, you know, we're not just investing in the new neighbourhoods in the county, but the well-established ones too. And we recognise that, you know, as the population grows and demands grow on our services, that, you know, people will want more parks. And so we've included $12 million in future parks development within this budget as well. Another big theme of this budget is diversifying and bolstering our economic base. Um, the 22 budget fully funds the complete zoning ordinance rewrite, an update that I think is 50 years in the making. Um, you know, businesses have changed over that time. The type of businesses we want to attract has changed over that time. And fully funding this will allow us to pivot our ordinances to attract those businesses for people who want to come and hopefully work here as well. But this plan, as, you know, as it says, is also mindful of the businesses. We recognise the burden that they've had over the last year. Um, this budget includes an increase in the licence exemption threshold from $300,000 to $400,000, which exempts an additional 400 businesses from the tax and reduces the Beeple bill for another 3,200 county businesses. In all, that means about two-thirds of county businesses will only pay the $10 fee and no longer be caught within that tax threshold. Additionally, on personal property for all residents, we're increasing the exemption from $1,000 to $1,500. This is the first adjustment we've made to this since 1998, and it alleviates the personal property tax bill on approximately 14,000 vehicles. It also expands the tax relief for the elderly and disabled citizens by factoring in inflation into income eligibility. The board recently took um, action to increase the 100% threshold from $28,000 to $31,500 for relief with adjustments, uh, automatic adjustments in the future for cost of living adjustments. So those that qualify today aren't negatively impacted by any changes down the line. But we also recognise that, you know, the cost the cost of this program does go up as the years progress. And so we are proposing a $3,000 cap to control those costs and to also make sure that that relief actually goes to those who need it the most. Another pivot of this budget is, you know, our continuing investment in our infrastructure. One of the things we've proposed in the CIP, again, recognising the quality of life aspect of this budget, is $19 million programmed over the next five years to promote community connectivity. You know, there's some limited opportunities in the county right now to go out, take a walk around the neighbourhoods, and this budget over the next five years proposes to start alleviating that. The plan also reflects for the first time a new capital funding source, the Central Virginia Transportation Authority, that gives us an additional 100 and, over $116 million over the next five years. Um, you'll see in the back of our budget book, we have an appendix that lists our unfunded transportation needs. It's now just crested over $4 billion. This Transportation Authority, while it doesn't, it's not a panacea to all the um, projects that we need to start, it will enable those projects to start that may otherwise remain dormant. And it also continues to adhere to all our major maintenance policies that we've set out over the last few years. And it also sets out the foundation for a November 2022 bond referendum for both the county and the schools. And on the operational side, with this heavy capital investment, we recognise that there's operational needs as well. And so for building and grounds and capital projects management, we're proposing ad adding additional staff to cope with this large influx of investment. So as I say, there's an enhanced transportation program you can see on the chart here. In fiscal year 22, it proposes about $43 million, rising to over 211 over the five-year plan, some of which I've already touched on. 
Um, you can see some of the projects on the right that will be funded in fiscal year 22. One of the things I will point out here, you'll see in the last line is the revenue sharing. One of the things we always try to achieve is, you know, if there's matching state dollars, we will always put money into those so that we can get the best bang for our buck when it comes to capital projects. And then just really quickly, a kind of referendum overview that we've laid out in our capital project over the next seven years. It totals about $150 million on the county side. For the school side, it's approximately $300 million. You can see there the investment in the quality of life and our public safety with the libraries at 52 million, parks at just over 18, and police and fire together just under half of that amount at 72 million dollars. And you can see the kind of time frame and what kind of projects we're proposing to go out to the market for over the next seven years. And then finally, really quickly, um, this was one of the presentations that came up yesterday to the board, it was the utility rates. You know, there was a freeze last year. This year, there's just a small increase of an average monthly increase of $1.50. But as you could see, even with our fiscal year 22 proposed amounts, it's still lower than our regional peers with their fiscal year 21 amounts, which I know they also have increases in their fiscal year 2022 budgets. And with that, I'll turn it back to Mr. Harris. Thank you, Mr. Dirk. And just a couple other notes, and then we will uh, we'll turn our attention to uh, to the questions. We got a few that have come in. Um, CARES funding, you know, it continues to be a topic. Uh, for those of you who may not know what that is, that is basically federal uh, support dollars that have been made available throughout the pandemic. Chesterfield County and Chesterfield Schools have certainly gotten, uh, you know, quite a bit of that, and there is more on the way. Um, I think the things to note that this proposal that uh, is before you this evening does not have any existing CARES dollars in it. Uh, it's not dependent on those dollars for ongoing operations. And the next round of CARES funding, I think that you know, really just got all the final signatures on it today uh, in DC, is not also not included here. So we will bring that back. Uh, you know, throughout the course of the next couple months as that rule book and all of the amounts are finalized. And we will, you know, bring that back and have subsequent public hearings, subsequent discussions uh, with the board, with the community on the best way to use those funds. But as we have done with prior rounds of CARES, we have found uh, one-time uses, whether it's investing in our technology infrastructure or small business grants or daycare grants or working with our nonprofits, helping out the food bank, uh, all the PPE and all the things that we need to bring. You know, the students came back uh, into schools this week. You know, certainly CARES played a large role there. So we will continue to spend those funds and invest them in that way, but this budget is not dependent on any of that federal assistance. Um, also, on a similar note on the state side, state budget is still wrapping up its uh, final steps. We don't have all of those numbers, and again, all of those rule books that uh, are associated with that. That's something that we would bring back to the board. Uh, we do have state funding in here for a variety of things, state support. We'll bring that back to the board for adoption that, is, again, is scheduled on April the 7th. Again, tonight, and I think a very germane to our, our purpose here. This is just a proposal. This is the county administrator's proposal. The board received it yesterday, and we are turning our attention to that community feedback phase of the plan, but it is just a proposal. Everything in here is, uh, is still up for conversation. So tonight, we are simply walking through what the county administrator has gathered and heard and presented to the board yesterday. As Mr. Holland touched on, rightfully so, in his opening, we have five Facebook Live events. They all have a, a district designation, as he said, but it bears repeating. You don't have to live in the Matilica District to, uh, to tune in on the 22nd. You can come to any or all of those that you want. Uh, we will be recording those uh, presentations, as we did yesterday, and you can watch that uh, material at any time as well as we have our blueprint at chesterfield.gov email address that works 24 hours a day. There's an online feedback form where you can go. You can ask a question. You can simply leave a comment. All of those <laughs> questions will be answered uh, to whomever asked them. We also aggregate all of that information and present it to the board uh, in concert with their public hearing on March 24th. So if you can't come out on the 24th, uh, we recognize, you know, COVID is still very much, uh, you know, with us. All of that information, whether it's an email, the online form, 
Uh, even the questions we get in the Facebook Live events, we aggregate that information and uh, we will present that to the board members. The, the board uh, has an audit finance subcommittee that Mr. Holland uh, co-chairs with Mr. Winslow, and that's actually an item on their agenda next week is to go through the feedback that we've received thus far. So uh, we do take this part of the process very, very seriously, and we make sure that all five board members have any questions, comments, thoughts uh, that the public might have. With that, uh, turn it back to Mr. Holland. I don't know if you have any, any final comments, and then we'll, we'll jump into the questions. Yes, I do. I just want to thank you thus far for the presentation. And I think our citizens can see that Chesterfield has weathered the financial pandemic storm due in large part to our great employees and, of course, the county's longstanding approach to great physical management. So I'm very pleased about that. And certainly thank Mr. Harris and Mr. Durkin for their presentation. And we certainly appreciate your joining us tonight. If there are questions, we certainly would like to uh, receive those. First question. Uh, we'll read the question. Uh, I'll take it. Question it? from Julie right. about the real estate tax rate. What is the proposed tax rate on real estate uh, with the increased assessments most county homeowners experience in interested to see if it will be a reduction to keep it neutral? At this point, uh, Julie, our rate is proposed at 95 cents per 100, which is not a reduction. Uh, we are experiencing pressures from, of course, ed education spending, uh, schools, uh, uh, county services in need, our pay plan for our public safety employees, which has been long overdue. And so at this point, we do not envision reducing the tax rate. But thanks for that question. And I'll let someone else take the second question, and we'll comment as needed. And, and Mr. Allen, just to add on to, uh, to your response, which is mm -hmm. spot on, I think we did discuss, and the board has mm -hmm. asked uh, the administration and staff to, uh, we, we do a five-year plan, so we do a, a rolling mm -hmm. five-year uh, look at expenditures and revenues. And we definitely had a, a disclosure and discussion yesterday that, you know, that real estate rate, particularly, and in, in Dr. Casey's, uh, you know, understands that as part of his mission, that we look at that every single year. And again, if we stay in sort of that three to four percent range on reassessments, uh, you know, that's that's what we need in order to pay for ongoing operations. When it starts to get north of there, uh, that real estate rate very much comes into play, and that was uh, certainly a part of the conversation yesterday to keep a keen eye on that as we go through the remaining four years of this five-year plan, uh, you see a lot of tax relief. Again, the broadest package of tax relief that, uh, that the county has ever offered, but it really is targeted in this year at those uh, particular populations we felt were most in need. So, uh, but we understand the question, we appreciate that. And again, it is absolutely something that, uh, that remains in our mind at all times. A question from Erin on SOQ funding. And she asked, and is very plugged in, obviously, does the increase in local revenue have a negative impact on our composite index? And what Aaron's talking about there, again, going back to that state formula that we touched on a little bit, uh, there's really two pieces. The composite index is your, what they consider, your ability to pay. So of that relationship between state and local funding for education, your composite index is what percentage of that relationships are the locals uh, responsible for. And certainly as you have better economic conditions, your percentage of the overall pie, you're expected or you know, to be able to pay more and more of that. So again, we have a strong local economy. The next time they update that composite index, we could see some upward pressure in our percentage. That's a natural thing. Uh, that's not really what we were referring to. We, we will always make sure we are in compliance with that, with that composite index. The other piece is the standards of quality. That's the overall profile of education, the model that the state dictates. And I think the message earlier in the presentation was, we feel like in Chesterfield County, and we hear from each one of you, uh, you know, residents, because it you know, is a major part of what we do here, that the state model is insufficient to provide the full range of quality uh, offerings in a school system that, that our folks want to see. And on average, you know, we are going $130 million or more above what the state says that our composite index uh, would put in. So even if the composite index goes up, we are still going to be in that supplement phase because we want to respond to the preferences that our, our community has. So a very, very good question. Uh, 
Third question here, with all the new houses and apartments, there's a growing need for new schools. Uh, new schools are being built and already overcrowded and need trailers and uh, more, more of a comment, but certainly we understand the sentiment. Uh, that's one of the reasons we put the single family chart in this presentation. Again, when you look historically, and there's pockets of the county, we recognize. If you're out on the Western Hull Street uh, and you're driving back and forth to the store or work every day, you're seeing a lot of residential construction. But we look at it on the whole, Chesterfield County is still in a very manageable growth pattern, and we are looking to you know, put those uh, pockets of relief in place. The Mosley Elementary School will open uh, this fall. That was a you know, joint effort of these two boards to make sure that even between a referendum, we could go in and put a facility to deal with some of uh, the overcrowding out in that portion of the county. And when the school division brought forth their proposed CIP, inclusive of what would be in a referendum, uh, there's another reliever elementary school out there. Overall, the, the proposed school referendum really focuses on sort of those capacity challenges at the middle school level. And a reliever for Tomahawk uh, Middle School, Fallen Creek Middle School, uh, whereas the 2013 referendum was geared towards the elementary issues. Uh, I think you're looking at that bubble sort of flows through the system coming back with this referendum, focusing primarily at the middle school level. So it's, it's a good question, it's a fair point, but I do think the package that the school division has put together thus far does address a lot of that. And again, I think Mr. Durkin touched on it as part of his remarks. We originally had thought that referendum would be in November of 2021. Uh, not sure that's entirely the uh, the best time frame for us to do that right now. So we have tentatively postponed that to November of 2022. That by no means suggests that we will uh, take a year off from our capital efforts on both sides, county and schools. We can use the, the 12 to 18 months that are ahead of us, ahead of the referendum, to do a lot of design. Uh, if a middle school prototype, for example, needs to be retooled, on the county side, you know, we're, again, we're looking to getting out of police station leases into permanent facilities. Uh, we can do all of our work, pre-work, uh, to give a very specific rec rec referendum recommendation to the public. This is what we would do. This is where it would be. So it allows us to have a finished product almost for the voters to go in and weigh in on in November of 2022. A lot of that work would then happen after the fact. But so when that, it's a... We assume and hope a, a yes vote on that referendum package. We're then able to turn around very, very quickly, county and schools, and, and get to work on putting those facilities on the ground. So there really isn't any lost time with the delay on the vote. It's just a matter of when that, uh, that pre-work occurs. So we will be very, very industrious and use all of that time very wisely. Looking down at the team, not seeing necessarily any other questions oh, just yet. Uh, Mr. Holland, any, any, any closing remarks? Y yes, indeed. I just want to take this opportunity to say uh, thank you, uh, certainly Mr. Harris, Mr. Durkin tonight, and uh, outstanding everyone for being here. Uh, you see a lot of people who are here supporting the camera, supporting uh, the TV. Uh, thank all of you. As I've always said, we have really great employees, and I want to thank them for their hard work, especially over this year of the pandemic. Uh, Chesterfield has transitioned and made a difference in the uh, lives of our citizens, and we want to continue to hear from them. And of course, uh, your comments are well received, appreciated, and each supervisor will certainly be uh, receiving these, your comments from tonight and from each of the presentations. Uh, feel free again to uh, join us uh, or join other district presentations as you have an opportunity and always share your input because together we can make the difference happen here in Chesterfield County. Thank you all again for joining us. Have a pleasant and great evening. Take care and stay safe.